<laughs> we made it through the last moment of today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Vini Jaiswal, and I'm here to present about, uh, you know, one of the most talked about topics. And of course, I'm traveling from United States to Japan, so this naturally makes sense, a topic. So a little bit about myself. I have been working in open source uh, for over a decade now, and mainly I have been working on data and AI technologies through my time at City, Databricks, ByteDance, uh, and I also had um, opportunity to work on some of the uh, popular projects, Delta Lake and uh, Apache Spark and MLflow. Some of them um, we started from the lab and grew it to a lot of subscribers. Now, since we have an interesting topic today, language plays a fundamental role in facilitating communication and uh, expressing our interaction with the people, right? For example, I imagine myself a time where, you know, I was in Italy and I was talking, trying to talk to uh, people there in Italian, but I didn't speak Italian. So we relied heavily on cell phones to do the translation. Luckily, back then, uh, Google Translator was a thing, so we could actually somehow make it work. Now, actually, it has grown a lot better, but um, that's why such human uh, requirements allowed us to think about how we can make machines uh, go beyond the traditional boundaries of uh, programming and communication. And that's why large language models evolved as the cutting edge artificial uh, systems that can process text and uh, can help us communicate coherently. So as I said, the need for AI models, uh, LLMs generated from our own requirements of translation, summarization, information retrieval, and think about lots of developers, we are an open source community. That means we, uh, we are able to talk to so many developers around the world. And now we have grown quite a lot uh, in terms of how we have um, contributed to the projects as well as how we adopt projects from different countries because now we are able to communicate. One of the main thing when we code or when we talk on a GitHub issue or PR is how well you can communicate, right? So communication is not just translation, it is also how about you document, how you summarize, how you are able to understand the context of each other, right? Because we all also come from different cultural backgrounds and we have to understand the nuances and uh, barriers, right? So recently we have uh, seen significant breakthroughs and we witness la language models. So that primarily are attributes to the deep learning techniques that we see um, nowadays. So how many of you have heard about ChatGPT? <laughs> Everybody, right? <laughs> so um, it released exactly one year ago and just it, it was a record breaking technology, right? Because this whole year was went into how we can make that work, how we can transition to using chat GPT and making that a viable part of the technology architecture or the businesses that we are uh, conducting, right? So just in two months, it had 100 million plus users. But actually, things kicked off in natural language processing way before chat GPT and GPTs. The possibility of automatic, mach automatic machine translation has long been an object, for fas uh, object of fascination for mankind. It finally uh, uh, materialized in 1950 when Alan Turing, who actually began to create computer systems for human interaction. So, what he did was he actually created some experiments and finally he came up with Turing test. So have you seen the imitation game? Basically, um, Alan Turing, who was a British scientist, he uh, and the main character of 2014 film noted that uh, to learn properly, a commu uh, computer should understand how to imitate human interactions and how you can trick a computer in communicating as if it is talking as a human. So 
even now the test he has uh, created back then uh, in attempting to have a communication language between a machine and a uh, human is, uh, is a standard test that a lot of language models go through. Like, in, uh, like Google also used it to pass the Turing test to create their, their de uh, decoder uh, model. So it basically judges how well you can <laughs> trick a computer in understanding that, oh, this is not a machine generated, but human generated um, context. And if we double uh, the uh, deep dive into these in inventions, this is the timeline. A lot of inventions have happened other than this, but let's look at some of the key important ones. So Turing test I already covered then in 1956, well around 1955 to 1956, John McCarthy uh, actually coined the term artificial intelligence. And at a Dartmouth conf conference, he presented about the artificial intelligence concept. And then few more, uh, for example, uh, in 2000, in, uh, in uh, 1968, there was a uh, there was a robot which was developed by researchers. It was named Shaky. And then uh, further to carry on, uh, Siri was also developed uh, ar around around this time. And then it was integrated into I uh, iPhone 4S 4 in 2011. Um, one of the other notable things that we see is uh, uh, IBM Watson. So if, if you were around 2011, IBM Watson was actually developing a lot of, uh, a lot of experiments on how Watson will work. Uh, finally, one of the other things was Amazon uh, Alexa that we all uh, kind of use now. In 2014, Google actually, um, uh, Eugene uh, actually, uh, built a chatbot for allowing uh, people to do that. Uh, and fast forward to 2020 when OpenAI actually had a GPT, uh, well in 2015 GPT was introduced by OpenAI, it was a paper that they showed and fast forward to 2022 they released a um, GPT, uh, chat GPT model. So as, as I said, uh, you know, this year has been transformative because of what happened in November 2022. So this is a survey by GitHub. It actually shows you how much activity was done in GitHub alone by open source community. We had a total projects growth of 27% year over year, which is like 420 million. Developers are heavily using generative AI. It is another um, coding that people are, uh, another, uh, projects that people are uh, uh, people are working on which is how ai can be used in their own projects and another key thing here is developers are operating cloud native applications on a large scale because now everybody cloud native solutions have allowed us to work on more experiments more access to more technologies and the highest number of first time open source contributions happened in 20 23 and more projects around generative AI were created this year alone. So this actually shows you the magnitude of how much uh, generative AI has taken over, not just buzzwords, but also how much work is being done by the open source developer community. And this is a graph of how large language models have evolved over the years. In 2023, you can see that there, there have been a lot of large language models and they are still getting built as we speak. Now on to how do LLMs work? So this is a paper which was released by Google in um, uh, 2017. Uh, it was about AI architecture called transformers. Transformers, basically I will show you an architecture a little bit later. They named this paper, attention is all you need. That means all large language models use components of transformers as a part of their architecture so that um, they can interact with machines with plain English text, which is also often called prompts. Now, sometimes you won't get the output as you expect, so you have to change the prompts um, so how many of you tried three, three, GPT 
and how many of you compared that to GPT-4. You can see massive difference. And if you keep on repeating the words, providing more context to your, uh, uh, to your chats, it will actually develop more intelligent responses. And that's why it says attention is all you need, because you have to get it to pay attention to context, pay attention to some of the, uh, some of the complex prompts. So let me actually demonstrate a little bit of, for example, I will just ask, can you give me, can you give me a summary of the book, Sapiens? Now, as an adult, I might be able to recognize this outputs more. It talks a lot about uh, summary in terms of revolution, in terms of humankind, in terms of industry, scientific, capitalism, and whatnot, right? What it is missing is who the audience is. For example, if you are teaching this to a six-year-old kid, they won't understand this. So I have to provide a little bit more context on So now it is actually doing a storytelling. So you are guiding the prompt to use the way you wanted to uh, explain it to you, right? So you have to provide those prompts. And that's why, if you remember, there was a trend a few months back, prompt engineering. Everybody was hiring prompt engineers so that they can develop good prompts. I will show you in later slide why, where those prompt engineering uh, efforts went into. But yeah, this was one of the example on why it needs an attention for your prompts. All right. So let's talk about LLM architecture. There is a lot which is going on behind the scenes to just simply chatting with a chatbot, right? So as I said, Transformers was a paper uh, that was released with, uh, released, uh, the paper that Google released had Transformers. Uh, so Transformers has, uh, has few components, sorry, Transformer architecture has few components, uh, which is Transformers, parameters, tokens, and context uh, window and length. So let me explain in detail what each of these components mean. This is the diagram from the same paper, and this shows you Transformer architecture. You can actually see there are two parts to this architecture. The left part is encoder, the right part is decoder, now you can see there are different layers to this architecture. For example, under the input, it has, on the encoder side, it has six layers. On the decoder side, it has six layers too. And I will just take a very uh, easy example for explaining this in simple terms. For example, if I want to translate Japanese to English, that will act as my input on the left-hand side. Basically, encoder will take that input. It will use different uh, layers within the encoder and give it uh, and give it basically um, basically it will break it down into different tasks. So it will foc one in uh, one encoder will focus on a specific input, and uh, this will then feed into decoder layers on the right hand side. Um, and encoder and decoder can be used independently or together on uh, to work on a task. Now, not every model adopts this whole architecture. What large language models we have seen, some of them just adopt the encoder side, and some of them are decoder-only models, and um, some do accept both encoder and decoder type of architecture. For just the encoder type, Basically, uh, if you want a simple uh, translation or summarization, you will use encoder um, transformers. But if you want uh, more, uh, more extensive um, 
uh, tasks, for example, generating text or generating um, uh, generative tasks like GPT-3, GPT-4, those, those language models use decoders. And uh, most of the research also was done on the decoder side, just to call that out. Now the second component in our architecture was parameters. So this basically looks like a lot of layers, right? So when actually we talk about parameters, uh, when we talk about large language models, we are also always talking in terms of, oh, how, how big the parameters was, 170 billion, 30 billion, whatnot, right? So basically, uh, GPT-3 is 175 parameters model, and Meta's largest Llama 2 has 70 billion parameters. But what do you mean by parameters, right? Parameters are basically a neural network and are variables that the model learns during the training process. So as you can see in the diagram, there are multiple layers which this neural network has, and every circle that is represented in this diagram is basically a node, and it has an output layer. So basically, how do you calculate how big the parameter, how big the, uh, pa how big the parameter is for a particular model? For example, this one, on the left hand side, there are three nodes. So basically, in the calculation, what you do is, the f when I just talk about the first part, there are three nodes plus it is feeding into four four nodes. So it will be three multiplied by four plus four, whatever hidden layer one uh, has. So that will be three times four, which is 12 plus four, 16. And then when you uh, go into the next section, it is four by four. So it will be four multiplied by four plus four, because that's what the hidden layer two is. So it will be 16 plus four, 20. And then the last section is four times one, so it will be four times one plus one. So in total, it will be 41 uh, parameters. So when we talk about large language models, it is combination of a vast majority of neural networks, but that's how you calculate the whole end-to-end -end neural um, network for parameters. And um, so I just show you how to, I just showed you how to calculate the parameters for a fully connected network. All right, so now since we learned about the parameters, um, and the variables that the models during the training process go through. Uh, let's look at how the next layer works. So third component I showed you in the transformer architecture was uh, uh, a tokenizer. So this is a screenshot from uh, OpenAI. Basically, you can see that there are few lines that were written in, uh, in that prompt. If you see the output, each, each uh, word is translated. So we always think about how GPT translates or outputs your uh, query is word by word, right? No, it actually queries by word by, it translates word into tokens. Even the spaces and special characters will have a token. So uh, if you can see many words map to one token, each space in that, um, in that line has a token. And that's how it calculates how many tokens are generated for this specific character. For example, if it is a tokenizer, it is made up of two words, token and izer. And even for full stops and spaces, it will give, give it a token. So basically, a tokenizer is, a, is, a, uh, is composed of number of tokens plus number of characters. That's how you get to uh, the calculation. All right, so now we uh, already know about transformers, we know about parameters, we know about tokenizers. The next thing which comes in LLM architecture is context length. <laughs> this was actually generated by ChatGPT. <laughs> I'm giving a ChatGPT talk, so. <laughs> um, so basically context length is how much your um, chat remembers the context, right? Some, uh, if you look at, uh, how, how many of you have played with OpenAI Playground? So in OpenAI Playground on the right hand side, there is a selection menu where you can select the underlying model as well as um, how many 
uh, how many context length you want for the model, how many truths, how many, how much penalty should it give for repetition and all those things, right? You can also describe how much context length you want for each prompt. So basically what context length means is how much of a context you are providing in the input sequence so that output gets better. For example, um, uh, uh, I think GPT for GPT-4, um, 32K has 32,000 um, uh, context length. So you can provide almost 50 pages of information into the chat GPT and basically uh, get the output from it. Before, one year ago, you, you could not do that much uh, lengthy uh, input syntax. You have to minimize your syntax so that it generates the output for you. But now, the size has gone bigger. So now you can also feed in the documents, feed in multiple information so that it remembers the context. You are basically providing it the knowledge of history and whatnot so that it can give you intelligent outputs, right? So that's what the context length means. Now imagine what must be uh, what it must be like in 2020. The transformer architecture in 2017, the paper I showed you, was almost proving better than anything before. But this is the time was when there was significant experimentation going on. OpenAI released a bunch of papers. Did you know that how many researchers they hired over the years? They hired so many researchers around the world just to work on language models, just to work on like those papers. And finally, the output that we see is um, tremendous. So some com companies, I talked about the transformer architecture. Some companies focused on decoder portion, and some companies focused on the encoder portion. But there were also the talks around which language models will perform better. That's where the scaling laws for language model performance comes into play. Now, how do we go about deciding which uh, language model performs better, right? So let's take a look at some of the results. On the first one, y-axis actually shows the test loss. And the x-axis shows how many parameters we have given. Um, so you can see that the graph is not linear. It is going down. That means more the parameters, less is the test loss. So the performance will be better in this case. The less the test loss, the more the performance. If we look at uh, data, oh, first let me tell you why I'm selecting parameters, data size, and uh, compute. Because these three were the parameter. These three were actually the uh, actually the considerations for how you determine performance. If people talked about, oh, we should give, we should train model multiple times. We should maybe try to increase the data set size, maybe we should try to increase the parameters. So there were a lot of debates around which, uh, uh, which were the considerations you have to use to uh, come up with like performance, uh, high performance models, right? So anyway, going back to parameters, more the parameters, better the model is. Then data set size, everybody agrees, right? We have to have more data size so that our models can perform better. So uh, you can see that on the uh, y-axis, we have test loss. If you have less data set size, test loss is higher. That means model will not be performant. Um, and similarly, in the compu compute, uh, over the compute, the more the compute, the test loss is less. Now, there are a few ways to go about this. For example, if you increase the model size, that means you have to increase the compute so that it finishes in time and it finishes better. That's why compute has a little bit of different, um, different graph. And uh, language model, uh, what this data tells us is language model improves when we increase the model size, when we increase the amount of training data and compute as well. Oh, by the way, compute is measured by petaflop days if you are wondering what PF days are. Now, when we take three of these graphs together, they are basically telling us that language modeling performance is better when you increase the model size, as I talked about, data for training and compute use for training. So basically, whenever you are factoring in how I should go about training my uh, model, those are the three factors you should cons consider. 
Um, and then OpenAI team actually went on to propose that uh, we should increase the model size. So uh, there were also some arguments about how, how about we increase the steps in the model. But they actually proved it in a paper. So with the bigger, uh, with the bigger mo model size, they also had to select more data set uh, size. And it was published in 2020. So you might still question why open uh, OpenAI researchers went on for such a large model, given that you know some models when it existed they were only a couple of billions of parameters. But you know when GPT-3 was launched, it launched with 1.3 billion and then 13 billion and 175 billion. Now let me show you wh what the difference is and how you go about uh, increasing the model size. So when we look at, on the y-axis is the accuracy of the model, and on the x-axis is how many uh, number of examples of context we are giving to, the, to a specific model. So when you had 1.3 billion parameter, you can see that on x-axis, x um, even though we give so many examples of the context, it still is not performing because you are not increasing the model size. Parameters are still 1.3 billion. But as soon as you give more parameters, um, um, the accuracy just uh, spikes. And then there is a zero shot and one shot on the top. It actually shows you that on um, just by increasing one more, uh, few more concepts, context in the example model, you can, uh, the 175 billion, billion uh, parameter model actually spikes up. So it was like a factor of both the context as well as the parameters that performed well. That's why um, you know both of these factors matter a lot when you are thinking about model size. Now chat GPT, uh, as, as we already saw this, uh, let's dive deep into what few of the offerings were from OpenAI. So we saw three offerings, GPT-3, GPT-3.5, chat GPT. Um, GPT-3 was actually uh, released a, a long time ago, but it only generated text and doesn't follow instructions. Then came GPT-3.5, uh, which follows instructions, but um, it was an upgrade for allowing language models to follow more instructions and uses supervised fine tuning so that your uh, requests are actually uh, fine-tuned better. And then when chat GPT came in, it actually came in with the optimized prompts. So you are able to talk to a computer and get your responses. It also allowed for programming languages. It can give you the output of code. So it was able to handle progr programming as well. And then GPT-4. Basically, in the previous one, you can only give text and instructions. GPT-4 uh, allowed you for the ability to not only provide the text input, but also upload files and images. So now it can actually uh, look at your images and provides you an output in the text format. Of course, it's changing as we speak because our brains are getting very creative. Our human, <laughs> uh, we always wish to have more capabilities from AI. So. Uh, it's uh, evolving constantly. Uh, this is actually the compar uh, comparison of different models. But let me actually show you a slide. Yes, this one. Um, Palm 2 was a model which was released by Google. And it performed so well. It had, it had uh, well, I don't have the. It, I, 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 don't, I don't think they released the parameters here, but you can see that when in April 2022, Palm was released by Google, it had 540 billion parameters. And that was actually one of the fastest high-performing models that was released. And uh, Palm 2 had evolved. Google did, didn't want to release much of the information on underlying data because of how much competition is going on right, right now. Hope, maybe that's the reason. So basically, Palm 2 was used in uh, some of the medical use cases. 
what it does is basically if you have an x-ray as i showed you right you can now give image as an input and it will give you text as an output by determining what the image is so if you give x-ray as an input to the model basically the large language model it will perform some uh, experiments on that image and it will actually give you the analysis of that x-ray report so you don't have to read in or if you don't understand the medical terms you you don't have you you don't have to f uh, further go inquiring a doctor sometimes we don't even know what to ask for <laughs> so gpt now can tell you about your health record as well um and then so we only talked about corporate models even though chat gpt uh, seems like open it's only open to use but they still haven't uh, made the uh, code available for open source community and that's why there were some researchers who wanted to open source some of the large language models so that community can actually build on those models and help them understand like what people are asking or how people are building their own applications using those APIs so there are three such uh, open LLMs meta released open pre-trained transformers um, in the open source and this is a couple of decode only pre-trained uh, pre transformers ranging from 125 million to 66, um, 66 billion parameters um, and they shared actually with everyone they also allowed researchers to request 175 billion parameter model because they really want to know how researchers are using LLMs for. Not everybody is trying to build the next LLM, right? There are some amazing minds there who also have um, their own creativity that they want to come back and work on the model. Um, and also, they, the OPT is tra trained primarily in English. Um, and then it, it actually provides you the code for experimenting with the models. Couple months later, Hugging Face, their research team actually received a grant for computing resources from French government. And uh, they, they trained the Bloom model. What they did with the grant is they worked together with a volunteer, uh, volunteer team of over 1,000 researchers from different countries and institutions. And then they created 176 billion parameter model this was decoder only transformer model you remember the architecture i showed you a lot of work is being done on the decoder side of the transformer model when we are talking about generative ai um, and then the team actually made everything available from the data sets they used in the open source and you can actually download it and run the model uh, so what this allows is uh, you know for bigger organizations corporate organizations when uh, they don't want to pay for proprietary models they can use this um, open source model uh, and also this did not uh, take off as much as other models did is possibly because other companies like google meta already had a head start they have been working on ai for many years so sometimes you know they have more context so uh, they, are, they have a head start. And then the third one is Llama. Everybody knows Llama. It was released by Facebook in February 2023. And they actually released uh, three models, 7 billion parameters, 13 billion, uh, 30, 30 billion, and 65 billion parameters. Now you know what the parameters is, right? Everybody talks about li large language model in terms of parameters, so this is where um, Hopefully your, your understanding is clear now, like why, why they talk in terms of parameters. This is why. And actually some, one of the good thing about this is they, uh, they used a lot of, uh, a lot of multilingual, uh, multilingual languages which are, um, which are non-English. If you look at GPT, it was mainly trained on English data and uh, multilingual uh, knowledge was still missing but i think they have improved a lot now so now you are able to communicate with chat gpts in different languages this visual gives you an idea of how impactful llama is this is by the community uh, as soon as they opened it up in the community everybody started using it and um, we knew from open ai research that training models with 
instruction it significantly improves the performance of the model right um, but since OpenAI did not release the data set in public and Llama did they became very popular um, and also um, if OpenAI had released the um, release the pre-trained model, it would have made much more easier for other companies uh, to make subset of the model and maybe run on a single GPU hardware. All right, so we talk about different models, right? How do you go about selecting a model, like which model is better, right? So as a researcher or as a open source contributor, if you do want to you know, know about how to compare the models, there are two main uh, benchmarks. Helm, which is holistic evaluation of language models. Actually, if you ask ChatGPT about what Helm is, it doesn't know what, uh, that it's, a, it's just a benchmark tool. It will think of it as a large language model. Maybe it has changed now with GPT-4, but uh, that used to be the case. And there is Hugging Face leaderboard. So this is the screenshot from Hugging Face. If you type in just Hugging Face leaderboard, this UI will come up. And it allows you to play around with uh, some of the model sizes. So depending on what you are trying to do, you can actually feed in model sizes, like what model sizes you want to compare with, what columns you should show in the report. Um, so anyway, that's about the selection part, how you go about using this leaderboard. but. You can see on this section that the models which are performing higher, their underlying architecture is Llama. So it is, that's why when we say it's high performing model, this is where it's coming from. All right, so now that we understand you know, how large uh, models work behind the scenes, hopefully everybody's still with me. Okay. <laughs> So now we know how it works. How do we communicate with AIs? Well, we have already figured out that we are communicating through interfaces, right? But AI assistance, AI is actually emerging as we speak. Now text is no longer a question. Now people want their own personal assistant using, uh, using AI, right? So this is a revolution that is happening right now. Every company is trying to work on AI assistants. Uh, so if you want like a personalized chatbot to help you with shopping, a personalized chatbot which actually helps you with daily reminders. For example, I'm a big fan of using Google, uh, Google Assistant at home. It reminds me every day of what my calendar looks like, what my schedule looks like, whether if I go outside. So those kind of things are actually coming in chatbots where you can actually personalize them. And because you control the input, you can also constrain the output, what it should, what it should, uh, uh, what it should inform you about. Another thing that is happening for personal assistant is you can make the input as personalized as, personalized as possible without leaving your data to in the open source or giving your data, right? Even chat, uh, even OpenAI, when they made an announcement in November during their uh, dev day. They also released that none of your data is being used for training because that was a requirement which was preventing companies to use chat GPTs and um, you know, uh, their assistants. So now you can actually use the APIs to, um, to make sure that you know, your proprietary information is not shared. Another thing which is coming up is you know, compliance, as you can see everywhere, right? Compliance is a big thing that people are talking about on ethical AI. Uh, so, well, technology is good. It's a good math and science, right? So, it, it's good that government is now helping us technologists to not um, completely turn off our projects, but helping how the usage can be controlled because that's where it comes in. There will be bad actors in the community, right? Who is always looking to do bad. And also, these systems should be used carefully because there is a concept co called AI hallucination. So when AI systems generate content that appears to be real, but it's not, it's actually not produced by humans. Um, I have run into problems where it just 
uh, output some machine generated information and it lacks the context. So whenever you use it, and even like some outreaches done by marketing or some companies, they don't even look at <laughs> output data, you know? So, uh, and then a chat GPT translation, a uh, revolution is here, but is ch uh, AI chatbot viable option for translation projects? It still hasn't reached to that uh, space yet. Uh, because it lacks a lot of cognitive ability that human has. So we still need that context from human. Because as I showed you, context length is very definite, right? Humans have the context of like a long memory, what incidents have happened in the past. So this all combined makes your um, uh, AI work better. So anyway, I think my time is running out. I had a few slides, so I'll just run over. But multilingual translation is still a gap although it performs better, but Japanese government is also trying to build their own LLMs, LLM models in partnership with SoftBank. Uh, so those are some of the things I want to call out. And this is the response from ChatGPT when I ask about, you know, what are the limitations on language? Yeah, so LLM limitations. And for AI to really work, uh, it has to be um, inclusive, it has to be influenced by everyone, not just technologists, not just one region, not just one country, but everybody. Na native languages, diverse perspectives. Think about doctors in different countries. They have to upload their um, cure. Sometimes they only have handwritten notes. So everything combined can make AI much more beneficial for, for humanity. Yeah, sorry I ran over a little bit, but thank you all for <laughs> listening. <laughs>